everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Helen Watt. Dr. Watt is a senior research fellow of the BIOS Centre and a research fellow of Blackfellow, Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Her publications include The Ethics of Pregnancy, Abortion and Childbirth and Life and Death in Healthcare Ethics, together with several books edited for the Anscombe Centre, where she worked until last year. Her research interests include reproductive ethics, gender, action theory, and issues of cooperation and conscientious objection. Dr. Watt will now be speaking on conscientious objection, and I'll hand this virtual floor over to her. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Clip, for your introduction, and, um, and I will now, uh, now begin to speak. Uh, healthcare and social care um, as such are wonderful vocations, as you will know much more than I do. However, they can also throw up problems of conscience, perhaps in ways that you were not expecting. How do you do your work as it should be done, with full respect for those for whom you care, respect for their lives, health and dignity, including their sexual and reproductive dignity? If someone else tells or asks you to do what you think is morally wrong, how exactly do you deal with that? If someone else is acting wrongly, just how close to that wrongdoing are you allowed to get? Keeping your job and your career are obviously important. One reason to be tactful and to know your legal rights. But if worst comes to worst, do you really do not want to lose something more important? That something is your moral integrity and ultimately your relationship with God. Whether or not you're ever placed in that position, you do need to be ready to refuse to do something wrong if that really is your situation. Unless we're all prepared to do anything we're asked to, conscientious objection should be on our radar. Any wrong feature can make our action wrong, and the thought this is wrong to do can certainly make our action wrong, even if it was, was not wrong before. We will sometimes make mistakes, but should at least not be acting as our conscience tells us not to at the time. Dilemmas of conscience can be stressful and complicated, and some of us here today may feel that in the past we have got too closely involved with some kind of wrongdoing in a way we now regret. Maybe we have confessed it and put it all behind us, but maybe it is something that still haunts us. Or maybe we have not run into problems or do not want to face it if we have. We should remember that if our conscience is silent, this does not mean we are acting rightly. At the same time, though, we should avoid being over-scrupulous and losing our jobs unnecessarily. In order to help others, we often have a duty to work together with those with whom we disagree morally, the only way this can in fact be done without actual moral compromise. So how to make decisions then? Getting advice and even a second opinion from someone we respect, like a trusted priest or professional colleague or even a medical ethicist, can help if we're unclear what to do. I should say the uh, Catholic Medical Association can be, a, can be a good source of help. Uh, some things may be clear to us already, like the fact we should never actually aim at the death of someone in our care, as opposed to just knowing they will die as a result of stopping burdens and treatment. Other things, though, may need more thought. For example, working out what kind of choices would make us actually complicit in the wrongdoing of others. It's good to be aware of some basic principles in the area of cooperation in evil, as, it, as it's called, which may help us steer our way. Knowing these principles won't solve all our problems. We may still need to get advice and use our judgment, but it does help to know what to, what to look out for and what kind of thing would be morally conclusive. Clearly, it cannot be the case that any connection with any wrongdoing of others is something we must avoid. We all pay bills and taxes, though few of us agree with all the ways in which our money is spent. Our newsagent may spend our money on his gambling addiction, or the government may spend our taxes on unjust wars. Or we can think of our daily work. If, for example, I'm a bus driver, one of whose regular stops is outside an abortion clinic, it is not necessarily wrong for me to stop at that stop knowing some of those getting off will be going for abortions. Unless I am actually intending to enable abortions, my action in stopping, though distasteful, is quite likely justified. Refusing to stop may harm both me and my family because I then lose my job, 
without in fact saving lives or increasing support for the pro-life cause. Moreover, not only do I not agree with abortion, but this is not even the impression I give as a bus driver by stopping at the stop. In contrast, if I'm a taxi driver and asked to go specifically to a named abortion clinic, this seems much more dubious morally due to the messages I would send out and the more targeted help I would be giving. So what are the basic principles in the area of cooperation in evil or wrongdoing? We should start with a key distinction, the distinction between formal, i.e. intended cooperation in wrongdoing and material, i.e. unintended cooperation. Material cooperation is doing what in effect assists wrongdoing or gives the impression of condoning it, but without sharing the wrongful intention or endorsing it in any way. Material cooperation can be either right or wrong, depending on various factors. I uh, will turn to material cooperation soon. In contrast, formal, deliberate cooperation in wrongdoing is always morally wrong. Formal cooperation is sharing some at least of the wrongful intentions of the main wrongdoer or intending that person have a bad intention. It is being a deliberate, even if reluctant, enabler of the wrong itself, or alternatively, endorsing or intending it from the sidelines. If I actually intend my colleague to do an abortion or sterilization, even if I do nothing to achieve that, that is formal cooperation in my colleague's unjustified act. The same is true if I actively pass a woman who wants an abortion or sterilization to my colleague, intending she perform one. Note that wrong here does not mean culpable. This is not about whether the woman or my colleague is to blame for the choice that she's making. The woman and my colleague may not be to blame at all. That depends on their state of moral awareness, their past choices, and so on. It's not about judging people or saying they're in bad faith, but about the objective wrongness of some kinds of action. Judging actions is not the same as judging people. And in any case, we should treat people with kindness and respect, even if we believe that what they're doing is morally unjustified, whether culpable or otherwise. What does all of this mean when it comes to dealing with requests for something we think is morally wrong? We may imagine passing the person to someone who will give them what they want will keep our own hands clean. However, in reality, this is not the case. It's not as easy as that to keep our hands clean. If it is wrong for you to do an abortion, for example, it's also wrong for you to get me to do one. In fact, this is even worse than just doing it yourself, as it degrades both of us, not just one. Neither you nor I is a cog in a machine. We are both moral agents with responsibilities, and you should not try and use me to do your dirty work for me, so to speak. What if your colleague would not actually perform the abortion, but would merely arrange for someone else to perform it? Here we need to remember that planning or preparing for a wrongful act is also morally wrong. It is not just the final getting ready or performing the act that is wrong, but everything else aim towards that point. To give a graphic example, let's imagine I need money fast and have a plan to rob people at knife point. That plan is wrong, as are my further plans and preparations. Say my plans to buy a knife and lie in wait. And it's wrong for someone deliberately to help me in my plans and preparations, as when a fellow criminal might sell me a knife for mugging purposes or suggest dark areas I might lurk in. As well as not intending others complete a wrongful action, we should not intend that others plan one. And many suggested solutions for conscientious objectors, objectors do involve intending others' wrongful plans. How then should healthcare workers, for example, deal with demands for what they see as harmful procedures? Imagine, for example, that I'm a GP who is asked for an abortion by my patient. If I'm a good doctor, I will respond with sympathy, trying to find out what is making this pregnancy so difficult and offering positive help. I may be able to offer medical help, such as drugs for hyperemesis, or signpost the woman to those who can help her with, say, accommodation. I might offer her a card for an organisation that provides such support. Incidentally, the organisation Pregnancy Crisis Helpline is available to connect women to their nearest source of positive help. 
Abortion, I would explain, is not in my patient's best interests as I see them. Pregnancy may carry some health risks, but is in itself a sign of health. In short, I'm more than happy to support my patient every step along the way, should she wish to change her mind. Perhaps, as this is a big decision for her, she may want to take some time to think it over and discuss it with her partner or family. As I say these things and more, I might mention to the patient as a factual matter that she is, of course, free to seek a second opinion from a doctor of her choosing. That may be something I need to tell the patient to try to cover myself with my employer and GMC so as to go on practising as the doctor and helping patients as best I can. It may also be help, something that helps defuse the situation. The patient may be more likely to hear what I have to say about support to have her baby if she is not feeling actively obstructed in her plans for an abortion. Having mentioned the possibility of a second opinion and told her it is a matter for her whom she may choose to consult, I might repeat my sincere offer of help should she decide to have the baby or indeed if she has any issues following the abortion. That is the way a caring, conscientious doctor might deal with an abortion request, give or take some variations. But my point here is that the doctor in this situation is not intending the woman pursue her plans for abortion. Not only is the doctor not intending her patient to get an abortion, but the doctor is not intending that she try to get one. In contrast, it will be very different if the doctor actually suggested the patient find a doctor who does abortions, or worse, told her exactly who to go to. In that case, simply in order to keep the patient happy, or at least get her out of the consulting room, the doctor is actually intending, if not that the patient ultimately get an abortion, at least that she try elsewhere. This is far more cooperation in her trying. It's not a truly caring or professional response. Uh, moreover, given what is at stake in terms of the loss of her baby and the impact on the woman herself, it is no more acceptable than inviting a suicidal patient to jump from another window, not one's own. What kind of message would that send out and what kind of concern would it show for the patient's health and well-being? Any good doctor treats health considerations as a large part, if not the only part, of conscientious practice. The GMC's document Personal Beliefs specifically says that the law does not require doctors to provide treatments or procedures that they have assessed as not being clinically appropriate or not of overall benefit to the patient. This is a separate reason from conscientious objection as the GMC understands it in personal beliefs. Uh, they understand it as non-clinically based objections to treatment that, in their words, may be clinically appropriate for the patient. Obviously, whether for doctors or for other health or social care professionals, there is no guarantee professional guidance and ethics will always coincide. In cases where they do not coincide, ethics, not guidance, must of course prevail. It is not for professional regulators, the law or the government to be the sole source of ethical guidance for anyone. History is full of examples where unethical laws or guidance caused very serious harm. That said, if, let's say, a doctor sincerely believes that abortion is not in the patient's clinical interests, the abortion can not only be refused, but refused simply as clinically unhelpful to the patient, at least as far as the GMC is concerned. We've looked at formal, uh, deliberate cooperation in wrongdoing and preparations for wrongdoing, which is always morally wrong. However, it's important to realise that material cooperation is not necessarily morally justified. Remember that material cooperation is cooperation that may help someone do wrong in effect, but where this effect is not intended by us. In trying to work out whether a particular example of material cooperation is justified, we need to compare the reasons for cooperating with those for not cooperating. These reasons include the harm done to ourselves and others by either course of action. Cooperating even materially in a wrongful practice may make us less sensitive to the wrong involved and may harm other people in giving them the impression that the practice is not, after all, so very wrong in our eyes. The greater the risk of corrupting ourselves or of giving the impression to others that we have no strong objection to some wrongful procedure, the more serious needs to be the reason for doing what facilitates this procedure. 
We might think, for example, of a hospital porter who wheels a patient into the operating theatre where he knows that she is scheduled for an abortion. Even if the porter does not intend the abortion itself, his involvement gives the impression to the patient and others that abortion is a normal part of hospital activities. We can imagine a question from someone who later regrets her abortion. Why did you just wheel me in like nothing was wrong? We can say something similar about the care worker who wheels someone into a room where they will die by assisted suicide in a country where assisted suicide is legal. Again, even if the care worker does not intend the assisted suicide, what kind of message does the weirding in send out? When it's not possible for ethical reasons to do what we're asked, it will be necessary to tell our line manager or colleague and let them handle it as they will. You could explain why you think something is wrong. You're not happy with how it ends a life, for example, or harms a person's health or takes away their fertility. Or you could keep it simple and just say that you're sorry, but this is something that morally you're just not able to do. It may be better to put your position in writing in advance if you can, perhaps getting advice on the email from a sympathetic source, like the Catholic Medical Association, uh, the ADF, uh, BIOS or the Anscombe Centre. You could make your point that you are well aware that those who take a different view from yours, that you realise they are free to act on that view and that you think it's important. They be treated always with courtesy and consideration. In telling your line manager, for, for example, that you're wrong, this does not mean you must or should intend your line manager do it instead. That would, of course, be formal cooperation, and formal cooperation is always wrong. You may foresee your line manager will do it instead or get your colleague to do it, but that doesn't mean you intend your line manager, your colleague or anyone do what you think is wrong. Knowing someone will do something and intending they will do it are two very different things. To try and preempt problems, it's important as far as possible to be confident, pleasant and upbeat in our daily work and to work and our flexibility where we can be flexible, that we are good and helpful members of the team. It's often better not to assume hostility, but rather to invite colleagues to agree, as they may well do, that they would not wish to put us in a difficult situation by acting us, asking us to act against our conscience. Even those who want to make changes in the way they do their work, as they've come to the conclusion they morally need to make changes, uh, um, may find their colleagues tolerate such changes in someone they have come to know and respect. Taking a stronger moral line than in the past may not be as difficult as one fears. Obviously, we want to be communicate as sensitively as we can. There's no need to apologise for doing our job right or respecting those we care for. However, it's possible we may need to apologise cautiously for any genuine mistakes we may have made along the way. We need to look ahead, think of imaginative ways of getting around dilemmas, and generally protect ourselves as best we can, including by referring to human rights and employment law, as and when we need to. Please stay tuned for the panel discussion, as Ryan Christopher of the ADF will be saying a word about your legal rights and the support ADF can offer. Even those around us who do not accept a particular example of conscientious objection as reasonable should welcome the fact that there are people of conscience who are not prepared to do everything they are asked to. People of conscience, if there are health or social care workers, will think about those they care for and how they can serve their interests, rather than just about ticking boxes, pleasing employers or furthering their careers. As regards respect for those with whom they disagree, conscientious objectors may be more inclined, not less inclined to show such respect and generally should treat their job seriously and not merely go through the motions. I will end with a question. Who cares more? Someone who will do anything they're asked to or give any dirty job to a colleague or someone who cares enough to remember people's true interests and what their profession is all about? Thank you. Thank you, um, Helen, for your talk um, on a very complex and sensitive issue. I'm sure it raises a lot of questions for people here um, in this seminar today. 